I said, I'm just wondering about Big Rock, you know, because I'd had a discussion with them the month before I left. And I said, what does it stand for? I don't know what it stands for. You know, I can't identify as an individual what Big Rock means to me. And I think that's a bad thing. So, um, but I was intrigued. So I decided to uh, come out of retirement. So in March of 2012, I did what I call my 90-day dive. I've done a, a few turnarounds in my time, and typically what I say to a, the board of companies that do that, and even the management team is, you won't see me glad-handing. I'm gonna be diving deep to try and understand what ails this business. And usually those deep dives are where I look at, yes, data, but also do a lot of research, talk to a lot of people, both inside and outside, spend a lot of time with customers and consumers so that I can formulate an opinion. So one of the first things I did is I looked at product and I said, okay, um, let's have a look at how Big Rock goes to market. How Big Rock went to market was really designed to just drive one thing, volume. Nobody ever mentioned brand. Nobody ever mentioned, basically, the, the, the growth of our sort of consumer adhesion. All they talked about was volume. And the way they did it was by discounting product all the time. Great product. Product that didn't need discounting. And interestingly enough, that strategy got them four consecutive years of good growth, four consecutive years of profit declines. But nobody was ringing the alarm bell. It was so obvious to me as an outsider that that go-to-market strategy was wrong. It was wrong for what we were. We were really focused on one thing. What is this week's offer? What is the deal for the consumer? And in so doing, week after week, month after month, we dragged our brand down and down and down. Then when I looked at, okay, our go-to-market strategy is obviously wrong in terms of how we price, how we communicate our value proposition of the consumer. I said, what kind of beers are we doing? And I remember asking some people internally, I said, we've got a beer called Gopher. I think it's a pretty weird name for a beer. Why do we produce Gopher? Why does this beer exist? And the answer was, well, we're trying to you know, copy Molson Canadian. And I go, we make better beer than them. Why would we try and copy a beer that we shouldn't be making? And people said, you're right. We're not really, you know, as sales folks, we're not really keen on going out there and selling it. Well, then why are you doing it? Why? When you know your behavior is wrong, why do you perpetuate that behavior? But it got even worse. Because when we further looked into it, I realized that some of our beers actually carried, we call them adjuncts, or artificial enhancers that sweeten beer, that lighten beer, that hurt beer, and that hurt our brand. And most importantly, the craft beer drinkers around there, particularly in Alberta, where we had the majority of our business and still do, they knew what we were doing. We were viewed as frauds and charlatans as a brand. Once I'd gone through that part of it, I said, okay, what are consumers saying? So I, I, we did that two ways. We did market research, which I'll come to in a minute. And the second one was to look at blogs. In this day and age, you will learn an awful lot by going on to blogs. Not all of it true, but you'll learn an awful lot. And you'll also learn a heck of a lot all the time about what consumers think. Because one thing that kills me in almost every business that I've gone in, the turnarounds, when I've asked either a board or a management team, Show me the market research we've done. Every organization has said to me, we don't do research. We know what the consumer wants. Really? Anyways, the blogs were universally negative. I'm going to show you one of the nicest ones that is printable. <laughs> Crapper enthusiasts will probably not be impressed. They were being very kind. Then I said, OK, let's have a look at the customer. Who buys your beer? Moreover, why do they buy our beer? Why do they care about Big Rock? And we did the research, the research came back, and it turned out that the, all of the real growth in the craft beer segment 
were in areas in which we didn't play. And our customer was this customer. Not that there's anything wrong with this customer, but this is a customer who wants things to stay the same when the craft beer world around them are changing. So they, want, they are very traditional, they want everything consistent, no change, and they are extremely price conscious. That's not a customer long term that is going to be good for our brand. But I think more, more importantly, from, from my perspective, that customer was like me, aging and drinking less and less beer. That was a serious problem for the future of our company. And the question I asked myself, do we want that customer? Yeah, sure. That customer will age and continue buying our beer. Probably not buy some of the new stuff we're doing, but they'll stick with traditional and they'll stick with grasshopper. Uh, but increasingly, the customer that was buying more and more beer was a very different person. They don't want safe. They don't want the same. The craft beer consumer, I've always said, is a consumer that plays the field. They're extremely promiscuous with their beer. It's not like your dad who drank the same beer for 30 years. They won't drink the same beer for three weeks. They want new, they want different, they want daring, they want bold. All the things we weren't. And I said, okay, so we, got to make a lot, we have a lot of work to do with our beer, a lot of work to do with our go-to-market strategy, a lot of work to do with uh, certainly our reputation. How's our team stack up? Well, what team? We have some great people at Big Rock, but nobody ever collaborated. Nobody ever came together to say, look, let's, let's, let's work together to build something better. Every function was an island, and every island was surrounded by a moat. And here's where it gets really ugly. So the work I had to do is to bring the team together and say, guys, you know, at the rate this company is chasing volume and declining in profit in 18 months, we will be cash flow negative. And if we keep doing that for a little while longer, we'll be insolvent. So it's, it's, it's showtime. Uh, one of the things that really killed me, and, and at, at our initial sort of start of the business, the, the toughest part of the business was getting the sales force to understand that it's not about volume. It's really not about volume. Nowhere in Ed McNally's original vision, which I'll come to in a little while, did he ever mention the word volume? Nowhere. And the ultimate insult to our product was that our sales team didn't talk about craft beer. They didn't talk about the wonderful inspiration and stories that craft beer evokes. They talked about pushing liquid. What an odious word for a wonderful product. I remember when that came up the first time, when I heard the word liquid in a sales meeting, sales manager's meeting, I said, what business are we really in? They go, we're in a beer business. And what's your job? My job is to sell beer. I said, you're wrong on both counts. We are in the business of inspiring people. We are in the business of filling their aspirations. We're in the business, frankly, of telling remarkable stories about the inspiration we've had to produce new and remarkable product, some products that have been produced in hundreds and hundreds of years, some products that had never been produced before. We have to capture the imagination of that craft beer drinker who wants new, different, daring, bold, and risky. And you are not selling beer. You're storytellers. You need to inspire your sales team. You need to inspire consumers. And you need to inspire customers. Because remember, we're not lucky enough to sell directly to consumers. We have to go through governments. And we have to go through middlemen in Alberta. And they said, but if we're not in the beer business, I don't understand. How can we not be in the beer business? I said, this is the medium. The story is what matters. The, the, what's behind this beer is what matters to the craft beer drinker. 
Because if they're going to believe in it, and if they're going to own it, and if they're going to reach out and proudly hold it, hold it in their hands, it has to be something more than goddamn liquid. Sadly, we changed most of our sales team over the next six months. <laughs> now, after I'd gone through this and it had effectively ingested all of this, I said, okay, I'm going to have a chat with Ed, the founder. And Ed wasn't there. Uh, uh, Ed is 87 now, so he, he wasn't there. Uh, so I said, I'm going to sit in front of his portrait, and I'm going to have a pint. And I remember shaking my head, and there were people around me because we were up in the, uh, it, well, actually we were downstairs in the, uh, in the grill. And I said, how could it get this bad, Ed? This was obviously an internal conversation I had with myself, otherwise people would have thought I was crazy. I said, how could it get this bad? I mean, Ed's vision when he founded this brewery never mentioned volume, profit, money, or market share. What it mentioned was producing beers of unparalleled quality and taste, brokering no compromise with the finest and freshest ingredients, period. And that made a lot of sense in 1985 when there were no craft brewers, because it was all about the quality of the product. But now, that market has evolved. The expectation of craft brewers, of craft consumers, is significantly higher. They don't just want a beer. They want a brand that they can believe in and identify in. They want a brand that they can be proud to hold in their hands. And I'll come to this later on. So we decided that we're going to play to our strengths in the craft beer business. We're going to go back to our roots, and we will only produce all natural, remarkably pure, unpasteurized, fantastic beers with amazing stories and inspiration behind each one. That's what we're going to do. But we're not going to do one every three years. We're going to do two a month. And we're not going to be focused on volume. We're going to be focused on having people desire our product. So for example, this year, we will come out with over, by the time we're done, probably 24, 25 new beers. That's two a month. But all of those, save one, are short-term beers. Some of them are seasonals, but most of them are limited edition beers, many of them numbered. Because my view, and I think it's been expressed by some people earlier today, is I want people to desire my product. I want it to be rare, I want it to be precious, and I don't want to ever have to push product. I want people to want it. So that when we come out, they're going to the beer finder and they're looking for that product. They're running to the nearest liquor store or the on-premise establishment that has it. And that's what we had to do to rebuild this brand, to make it loved again, to make it desired again. I'm going to show you, it's funny, uh, about five months into my tenure, I had a meeting with the board and I said, I told you I would do a 90-day deep dive. And 90 days afterwards, I came to you and I said, this is what I found, this is what we need to do, and it's going to take courage, I used another word that is in the lower appendages of the male anatomy, but it's going to take courage, and, and frankly, it's going to hurt. And it's going to take several years, because you don't neglect the brand and drive it into the ground for over a decade and think somebody's going to come in and wave a magic wand in two years and fix it. So I talked to them about what we were going to do and the research results and talked to them about you know, the psychographics of the consumer we're going after, about a whole bunch of stuff that I've lived my whole life. But my board, as, and they were very, very intelligent business people, but they're all commodities folks out of Calgary. So we have upstream oil, we have ranching, we have farming, we have real estate. There's nothing wrong with those businesses. They're great businesses. They're backbone businesses of our, our economy and backbone businesses of, of Alberta. But they knew nothing about consumers. So all I got was this look. So I, and I knew I was going to get that look. So I said, I'll show them a movie. Everybody likes a video. <laughs> this is that video. There are faraway places a Canadian craft brewery should never have to travel. There are certain things no one in their wildest dreams would expect it to have to do. 
and ingredients it would certainly never have to go to the trouble of acquiring. Why would it then? Especially since doing these things is expensive, time-consuming, and in some cases, downright dangerous. It would if it realized it had lost sight of the reason it started brewing beer in the first place. For the love of beer. It would if people who worked there woke up one day and realized they wanted to be able to love their own beer more than anybody else's. And it would if the brewmaster was suddenly empowered to call all the shots on every beer it brewed. That's what happened at Big Rock anyway. We've got a second chance to get it right all over again. We now have the passionate people, the technical mastery, and the no compromise attitude to keep brewing the beer we love, stop making the beer we don't, and innovate new brews that, frankly, no one else has the inclination, the guts, or the resources to do. That means having the conviction to never cut corners, never compromise, and never take the beaten path. And then, having the courage to actually act on that conviction. That's why we will continue to journey thousands of miles across the planet for inspiration, continue to travel back through centuries of time for authentic recipes, always taking the paths of most resistance in our quest to find the inspiration for new processes and ingredients. That's why we will be introducing numerous new and startlingly original beers every year. And why what goes into our beer will never be anything but pure and wholesome, even if that means growing it ourselves. Our new, deliberately different approach produces real, no-compromise craft beer that is authentic, masterful, and audacious. At Big Rock, we are on a crusade, and we invite you to join us. The, uh, the board liked the video. <laughs> so, we decided to go from being the company that was all, always on offer to being a company that had a unique and compelling offering. Deliberately different beers, intentionally innovative beers. We became a risk taker again, like the early days. We took chances. We did stuff other brewers wouldn't or couldn't do. And we did it faster. I'm happy with where we are after 24 months, but I stand here before you to say we're not a great brand. We're not even a good brand yet. We have a long way to go. But this is the route we've chosen. You heard in the video, one of the first things I did when I walked in, I de-empowered sales to make the call on what beers we produced. And I empowered the one person who really matters in the beer business, the brewmaster. I said, Paul, if you don't want to make it, it won't get made. We'll push you, we'll challenge you. We'll ask you to do things we've never done before, but it'll never involve bad ingredients and it'll never create a bad beer. And it's worked out well. We have a brewmaster that for years had been suppressed, that is obviously creative. It's very difficult to come out with 25 new beers in a year. After a year, you've come out with over 20. God knows how many we'll dream up between this year and next because we'll take another inspiration tour somewhere in the world and get inspiration for beers. Get excited about it. One of the things I've said to our sales team early on is, if you're not excited about the beer, how can you get your customers excited? And if it doesn't turn your crank, why do you think the consumers will pick it up? I was stunned at, at, at the, the disassociation there. Second one is no compromise. This goes back to Ed McNally's original view that we will harbor no compromise in making our beer. You know, we've heard an awful lot about social media and how there are no secrets and you have to be transparent. People knew that Big Rock was doing this stuff. That's why the blogs were universally negative. That's why people said, Big Rock is, aren't they owned by Molson's? Oh, they're big beer. They're boring. Those are very hard things to hear. Even if you're new in the company saying, I'm here to turn it around. They're very hard things to hear. The third one is dare to be different. 
You know, whenever, whenever you are entering into a turnaround, you inform yourself as much as you can with research and knowledge and these kind of things. But then you have to have the intestinal fortitude to say, this is the way we're going, and it's going to be rough seas for two or three years, but at the end of it, we will again have a brand that people give a shit about. So that's what we do. We have this wonderful lineup of beers which we've repackaged, some of them for the first time in 28 years that the package has been touched. A lot's changed in 28 years, when you think of it. Where were you in 1985? What was your hairstyle like? You had hair. What clothes were you wearing? What beer were you drinking and what did it look like? Everything changes, except apparently our packaging. But over and above that, what really excites me are these beers. Beers that are way out there, beers that take risk, beers that sometimes fail on trial, and we drink it for a while and then we just throw it away and then we try again. But that's what this business is all about. That's what it was 28 years ago with Ed. And that's what we're trying to recreate now. And finally, we decided to talk to consumers. Instead of dealing with the middlemen, be they governments or large retail chains here in Alberta, we decided to actually find out what people thought. The people who actually drank craft beer. So we've done a lot of, a lot of market research over the last 24 months. And we've engaged in a dialogue. We moved most of our spending really to social media because that's where the craft beer drinker, at least not the older guys like me, but the craft beer drinker of today, that's where they play. But what were we doing? Billboards, hay bales in the middle of nowhere, you know, headline banners in the Calgary Herald. It might have worked years ago. That stuff doesn't work today. Even I know that, and the people in our company know that I am very social media inept and technology inept, but smart enough to know that you got to fish where the fish are. And you know whether that dialogue was with actual consumers, people who had abandoned Big Rock or had always been loyal fans and were curious about what are you doing, or people who had rediscovered it for the first time in 10 or 15 years, or whether it was with bloggers who you know, after, I was very happy to say that after about 15 months, the overwhelming majority of the blogs were positive. I, wanted, I want them all to be positive, wouldn't we all? So we still have work to do. Something else the research came out which helped shape our overarching vision for the company. And this, you know, when I do research typically, it's, it's to confirm what I believe in my heart is the right thing, based on research and talking to on-premise accounts in this case and, and retailers and so on. And that is that craft beer consumers want fresh, na natural, unpasteurized, locally produced beer. And we're local in the prairies. I'll stretch into Saskatchewan and Manitoba. We're not local in BC. We're not local in Ontario. And in those markets, we've been beating our heads against, against the wall for, in some cases, upwards of 15 years without ever really winning the hearts and minds, so to speak, of consumers. Part of it was because we weren't local. Part of it was because our just beers weren't there, as you saw earlier. So our overarching vision as a company is to be Canada's most innovative local national craft brewer. So how can you be a local national craft brewer? It's actually pretty easy. Today, we're based in Alberta. Uh, in roughly five and a half, maybe six months, we will have a wonderful brewery in downtown Vancouver. We'll be local, natural, fresh. We will produce beers that are relevant for that marketplace. And we will have our marketing resources in that marketplace, interacting with craft beer consumers. Our resident rock star in BC will be our brewmaster as our resident rock star here is Paul Gautreau, our brewmaster. And then next year, we're going to put roots down in Ontario. We will be local and fresh wherever our beer is served. And we will be in market. And we will be engaged. So that's the long and, store, long and short of the Big Rock story. We have come a long way in two years. I marvel at how we've been able to manage the pace of execution with largely the same team. Because I think the team is energized and inspired. They want to be that local, national, innovative craft brewer. And I found that in all of my turnarounds that when you come up with that winning strategy, 
you can energize your team and ultimately energize the consumer and inspire the consumer to buy your product. One, tell, one thing I can tell you is I marvel at how few people who run businesses don't do what I think every CEO or president or leader should do is have frequent out-of-body experiences. Because I'm a consumer, we're all consumers. And I like to consume brands that reflect my values. I like to consume brands that I think are good. I like to consume brands that really reflect my values, my belief system. Some people said ethos, that's a really cool word. But at the end of the day, if I'm gonna hold this beer in my hands, it's because I'm proud to, because they stand for something. And in Big Rock's, Big Rock's case, it's gonna be, we will never compromise, it will always be natural and pure, we will never pasteurize, and ultimately, we will always keep you excited with our innovation. Thanks for listening.